Welcome, everybody, to this week's show. This week, I am so excited to have Sarah Ganella with me. Sarah, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell, introduce us to our listeners. Perfect. Good evening, James. It's great to be here. Thank you for having, having me. Uh, my name is Sarah Ganella, and I am the a partner and VP of Full Sale Partners, and I oversee marketing and sales for the company, but I'm also the co-host of a live stream and we focus on breaking negative thoughts and habits and focusing on helping to build each other up and encouraging fearless authenticity. So a part of today, that's going to be part of our topic is helping people to be fearless in uh, the power of no, right? <laughs> that, yeah, yes, we are going to be talking about the power of no. Uh, what first really connected us really had to do with the power of now. Like we talked a little bit about that. We met on LinkedIn. We're going to drop, drop the W. That's what we're going to do today and talk about no. And it's it's been an interesting ride for us. Like this is our second go around. I'm, I'm all willing to accept it. Uh, you know, we did. I had some Internet issues and we're like, let's go back at this. And in going back at it, probably the best thing for me, it, really, it allowed me a little bit of time to think about uh, what and how we address the word no. Now, let's talk about no. What we we had originally a discussion about like the importance of it, and we had kind of different takes on it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But when we talk about the word no, like what what kind of feelings come from you when we talk about the word no? Yeah. So the word no is really two simple letters, and it's also one simple word, uh, and it is a complete sentence as well. And a lot of people don't understand that people can simply say no and move on. Um, but what I have found is that a lot of people sometimes have very difficult time saying the word no, and it can be a very powerful word. Um, but I've also found that as people start to use the word no, they start to learn also how to say yes without saying no as well. Well, and that's, we talked a little bit about that because the, the yes, falling into yeses isn't a great thing either. And I think that's what drives us to this discussion about the power of no. And that's something let's, you know, let's pause on that for a minute because being a people pleaser, being somebody who always wants to, you know, give people what they want. A lot of times we, I'm just throwing myself in there. Like I want to make sure that people are happy with the product that I'm bringing with this, with, with everything. So I have a hard time saying no, but also yes has created a lot of havoc in my life. So learning to say no is something that is not natural for, do you think half of us, a lot of us? I think a lot of us, and I think the word pause that you used was the, the key word. It is taking a pause to understand in the moment when you have an emotion and you're not sure which way you should go, yes or no, it's having that pause and understanding, okay, well, what's going on here? Why am I feeling this particular way? Because a lot of times what's packed with having difficulty saying no is that maybe you have guilt. Like you said, you're a people pleaser. And so there's maybe fear of disappointing someone or maybe someone not liking you. And, and I think that when we think about in the past, when we grew up, it's we were taught early on that we should listen to adults. We should always do the things that they say, that we're told to behave a particular way. And we're, we're told that authority figures, we should always do what it is that they, they are telling us. So we've actually been taught not to say the word no, but we have been taught in a lot of ways to say the word yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's something, so you're right. It's, this is almost a culture thing, but also just being raised in this in a lot of societies are like that, you know, you're raised to do your thing. Some are stricter than others, but mm -hmm. yeah, you have to say yes all the time. No is never an acceptable thing. And how to do no effectively, because when I look at the idea of yes and no, a lot mm -hmm. of times there's a thing called counterfeit yeses. That's something in negotiation where somebody will say yes, just to get you to move on, get you out of their office, get the guy off the phone. Yes, it's fine. I'll be there. And that on the other side, you know, we have to look at 
because of that mindset, we're looking at is there counterfeit nose in there as well. And I think the key where you're going to is we have to say them effectively, like say them with real meaning behind them. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we start to look at no, it's really evaluating your gut. And so what you said is that we're saying yes, but it's just a, you know, get it off the plate or to just agree, even though that's not where our heart is. So when we start to practice saying no, or even yes, you can really do that easily by having a, a gut check. And so it's just asking yourself, you know, do how do I feel in this particular moment? And what I have found is when you feel uncomfortable saying yes, that is a moment to pause and say, okay, well, why am I feeling this way? Or do I feel obligated to do something because I feel maybe guilty if I, if I don't do that? And you start to look at people within your life and the people that you feel like you need to say yes to. So when we think about those things, your boss, your spouse, you know, the responsibilities or the things that you have going on in your life that you want to please your kids, you want to please all of these people, but sometimes you get overloaded and you need the ability to be able to set some healthy boundaries. Okay, this is what's important to me. Here are my values. This is why I should do this. And that's really where the pause comes into play is understanding and doing a gut check to understand, am I just trying to do this to please someone? Or, you know, is this request, for example, crossing my personal boundaries. So it's, it's asking that question. Well, so you said boundaries and mm -hmm. I think that is probably one of the keys, right. To really understanding the no and the yes. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can, this is almost going to be a paradigm shift of the fact that if we're raised a certain way, so are others raised the other way. So there's people out there that don't think no means no. And where does no mean no? Because there's a negotiation uh, subsect that's out there saying no begins the negotiation. I mean, this is what Chris Voss says in yeah. negotiation specifically, but he's not saying no means no. Now, you have a very <laughs> clear story on why no means no. And how does no mean no apply and when? Yeah. I mean, and I can understand in a negotiation hostage situation you're needing to get that person to a yes. Um, but I can tell you from personal experience, understanding that no means no is super important. And so it, growing up, one of the things that a lot of times people had a part of their life is, oh, you should give you know grandma or you should give uncle a hug or you should, you know, even if you feel uncomfortable, you're still almost obligated to give that person a hug. And one of the things that I've really found is that we shouldn't do that because we are actually impacting people's consent and ability to be able to say no. And that can actually be very harmful. And I'm case in point. Um, growing up, was, I ended up having to learn how to say no. Um, because whenever I was young, I was actually um, molested by my uh, my cousin for a year. And then later on in life, I ended up finally going and getting some real help. And I ended up going into inpatient um, mental institute because I was having feelings of, of suicide. And what I found in that is they gave me a book called How to Say No When You Really Want to Say Yes. And for me, I wasn't involved in drugs. I wasn't involved in, you know, mischief or things like that. I was actually saying yes to almost everything. So I was overloading myself in doing, doing, doing in order to forget and not deal with what it is that I was dealing with. So I had to actually have a, a mental mind shift. And I really didn't learn this until much later in the power of no and why no can be so important to make sure that you are safe. And so if we go back to your question about boundaries, the difference is boundaries keep us safe, much like physical boundaries. So you think about a fence and it's meant to keep people in and it's it's a particular boundary. Well, the same thing can apply to our our 
mental health. You know, it, so those expectations give no property line to another person. But the boundary is what you set in what it is you're going to do to instill that boundary. Well, and thanks so much for sharing that story, because that really drives home. It helps me understand a little better why no is so important. Yeah. And really understanding boundaries, too, is who owns those. I mean, I, I, I understand if somebody can set boundaries, then we need to respect them. Yes. But how how do we set boundaries? Mm. Yeah. So I think part of it is understanding your values first and foremost. And so we have to understand our physical boundaries. And I'll give you an example of that. So my daughter growing up uh, in fifth grade, she decided that she did not like hugs. Well, as a mom, that's super hard. Like, I want to hug my daughter. Uh, and so, but I also knew the importance of that boundary. She said, I'm really not a hugger. So I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. It's going to be super hard for mom, but I also respect the boundary that you're setting and what it is that you're asking. So instead of just giving you a hug, I will ask you, I will say, can I get a hug? And you can say yes, or you can say no. And I will do whichever it is that you stated. And what that does is that really instills within someone that they have the ability to have consent over their physical body. Now, keep in mind, probably like six months later, all of a sudden she was a hugger again. Um, and now she hugs me all the time. But the fact that I ended up respecting her and respecting that boundary provided that trust. And that is what really boundaries are about. It's establishing healthy relationships with people. And keep in mind that it can be spiritual, it can be mental, it can be any, there are multiple types of boundaries. So when we think about things, in what is important to us, it's understanding what is important to us from a value perspective. And then it's letting someone know what that expectation is. Now, if that person crosses over that boundary, then we have to learn how it is that we then have the conversation to let them know, look, this was something that I had stated to you, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm not expecting you to now do anything. I'm letting you know the next time this happens, this is what I will do. Well, and tying this to communication, which everything, everything ties to communication. What an easy podcast, right? I picked the most common <laughs> topic you could ever, everything ties to it. But boundaries are big in all of our conversations. And what you're talking about is a communication technique, a device, yeah. it's protection, you know, it's a shield, it's whatever you want to call it. It's yeah. the ability to have the control for yourself to be in your now, right now, to say, I am yeah. in control of this by placing those boundaries. Yeah. So I think that's, um, I think this is just really brilliant in bringing out in regards to, to conversation, communication, and all of that. But this one here, like, you know, we had that start and the stop, and it really yeah. created an opportunity for me to reflect on our conversation that we had. And it was, it, it took me a while. Like I processed for, I have a very long commute into work today on Mondays, and it took me some time to really think about like, why, what is the connection between the no's? Like mm -hmm. there is, because I was seeing no, on the negotiation side, you're seeing no from the side that you just shared, which is completely personal and, and absolutely a power, you know, position of strength. And then it kind of came to me. And so the whole idea is there's, there's two notes, at least two, we're going to mm -hmm. stick with two today, but the no of refusal, that's where, uh, because I, in looking at negotiation, like no starts negotiation. That means no, doesn't mean no. I'm like, wait a minute. But if there's a no of refusal, if somebody says no, Yep. That is no means no. That's it. That should be a one and done. You're out. Forget about it. But mm -hmm. the one thing on the no side, I think that really has brought me into really talking about communication and really wanting to bring value to people who feel underserved, underspoken, who don't speak up for themselves. And that's why mm -hmm. I bring up this whole topic of communication is the no of, of dismissal. And that's the one I think where you look at somebody who is just dismissed. Why? Because they're a woman, because they're a man, because they're short, because they're tall, fat, yeah. and it doesn't matter. People are dismissed. And when they're dismissed, those are the, the communication 
responsibilities, not responsibilities, the communication skills that that we want to give to people to be able to speak up for themselves. And mm-hmm. I think that's the other side of that no, when you're told no in a in a way of dismissal, which to me, you know, when we're in a group, uh, you know, if you and I are chatting and, and I've shared this on the podcast before and somebody comes up, I immediately bring them in. You know, if and sometimes there are people who don't have any uh, that's a nice way to put it. They got no social uh, practice to know that somebody just walked up and you ignore them. I've been that person and to not acknowledge them. So that to me is a dismissal in a way. How do we bridge that gap? And so that's the other side of the known for me, like, all right, that's something that Sarah and James can work on. Like we can work on a way to really bring about, you know, no means no. To, to me, that's easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially in, you know, if I go in a bar or whatever, all those situations, you know, typically they're talking about leading to something, you know, sexual that somebody doesn't want to do or drinking or whatever it might be. No means no. But Mm -hmm. talk about dismissal. Have you been in places where you felt dismissed by a no? You know, whenever I think about that, I think it all depends on the situation. And as we have discovered it, It very much depends on the situation, like in the negotiation hostage situation, you're not wanting to really accept that no, because people's lives are at stake. Um, When it is a boss that is dismissing or a coworker that's dismissing another person's idea, that can be very detrimental as well. What we don't know is what's in the other side, why it is they're saying no. Because keep in mind, most of the time, it has to do with potentially fear. Fear of what? You know, fear of extra work, you know, fear of change, fear of, and so a lot of times it's maybe approaching the situation or the topic again to better understand where the potential barriers might be. Um, And sometimes what I have found is when someone simply gives me a no and they give it to me quickly, like there's something there. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to sort of respect them. But if they're saying, for example, No, you know, we've always done it this way. Okay, well, (laughs) you know, those are the seven most expensive words right there uh, in business is no, we've always done it this way. Um, And so, so you then have to figure out, okay, well, how can I now figure out a way to be able to help this understand the person understand the benefits? But when you say no, the benefits of sometimes saying no is because one, I might be burnt out or it doesn't align with my goals, or, you know, I need self-care, I I just have too much going on right now. Or maybe like in business, for example, I say no, sometimes to clients. And I say, you know what, we're not a good fit. So I think, you know, it's all context, and it's all depends. But for me, when someone adamantly says no, I have to sort of respect them, because there's something there that they are feeling uncomfortable. And if they're f- that adamant in quickly saying no, then, then it, then they're sort of, you know, shutting it down and I need to sort of respect it. If they're saying, eh, no, I don't really want to do that. That to me is sort of an invitation that they're still wavering. It's not a definite no. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. And when you talked about people saying no quickly, mm-hmm. that doesn't happen enough. I don't think. I don't and- think. And so you have a practice at your business where you have people practice. No, tell me more. Tell everybody about, uh, tell, tell me about my first week. I come in. This is my first week on the job. How are you going to onboard me? I got you. Well, this was actually with some specific individuals that they had identified that they were people pleasers. And specifically me being their their supervisor, the last thing I want are yes people. Um, And so for me, one of the best ways that I was able to identify how to help them is I needed them to feel comfortable saying no. And so uh, one particular person, I ended up going to them and I said, okay, I I have an exercise that I want us to try. And I said, for the next week, I want you every time I come to you to say no. 
And this person was like, what are you doing to me? Because they're like already uncomfortable with me even requesting that. And I said, they go, am I supposed to say no now? And I'm like, <laughs> I started laughing. Um, and I said, okay, here's the thing. I said, one of the things that you said that you or want to work on is that you're a people pleaser and that you tend to add a lot of things to your plate or say yes very quickly because you want to please people. You, you, but you, sometimes that can impact us as you have seen with, with being over, uh, uh, burnt out. And that's not one of the things that we want, we want in our company. So whenever I told her that, um, I ended up doing some different things where I would go to her and I gave her an unreasonable item that she was um, uh, an expectation that I had of her. It was over the weekend and there was a client. We had another employee out and I said, hey, um, I found out the information I need for you to send this person an email. And she's like, OK, I'm driving right now. Mind you, this is on the weekend. She was like, can I can I do this, you know, whenever I get get back. And I said, no. And she was like, gosh, she's like, what do you want me to do? And she was like stressing. And I, I'm like, look, you know, we had this conversation. No, Sarah, uh, you know, you don't even have to say no. I can get to that on Monday when I get back to work. That's all you have to say. So you don't even have to say no. Yes, I got that. I'll get it on Monday. And, and then if I have a problem and I needed it that, that weekend, for whatever reason, it was an emergency, we can do that. But I've had other employees, for example, and this is with clients, that they feel obligated, they must take care of situations immediately. And I said, so did the client say that they needed it done immediately? They were like, I, I don't know. They, but they reached out to me and I said, okay. So when a client comes to you, ask them, say, hey, right now it looks like my schedule is about two weeks out. I want to find out, is this something you need done immediately that I need to try to find someone to be able to help you? Or is it okay if we, you know, schedule this in two weeks? And they're like, oh no, you know, two weeks is fine. And so it's just having that conversation when in actuality they have almost an assumption or they feel obligated that they need to immediately respond or do things uh, with, with people. And I've seen this all the time. And you may have seen this at your boss sends you out something at 9 p.m. and you're like, crap, I need to respond back to that. Well, no, you don't. You can simply say the next morning, hey, I saw you sent me an email at 9 p.m. last night. Just wanted to let you know that after six o'clock at night, you know, I'm done for the evening and I will be sure to pick those up in the morning. You now have simply set the expectation and the boundary. You're setting boundaries, but I'm listening to you. I'm like, no, nah, I would have responded. <laughs> so I need to work on that. That's certainly something I'm like, six, I'm still working. What are you talking about? <laughs> but there's something that you that you touched on that I think is really important to talk about is the idea of you know that feeling to be able to say no, for one, but yeah. also to have that conversation with about deadlines. There's my friend, uh, Felipe Engineer Manriquez says all deadlines are a lie. Like they're... There, I've seen I've seen teams in, in multiple companies where they'll get a deadline and you work just all weekend to get it. And the client's like, Meh. I mean, they, they didn't they we wanted to react. <clears throat> we wanted to react and please them and get to it. But it really wasn't that important. So, and I've heard these words like it could have waited like they didn't know that you went into emergency mode. And that's what I love is have that clarifying question of, you know, is this a true deadline? Uh, at least have that, you know, yeah. upfront conversation, unless you got time for it. But I'm going to tell you, people who are people pleasers, they're going to find the time and it's going to be the time that they take away from their families. It's going to be time that they take away from themselves. So that's, you know, not necessarily even a good one is to look at just the time, but to look at, you know, that boundary and that respect, because that's yeah. exactly it. You hear, uh, you know, the opportunity to be able to say, does, you know, can it wait till Monday? And a lot of times it's like, oh, yeah. And I've seen that like recently on a couple of things. It's like, oh, yeah, I didn't need it right away. But the words, your tone, you know, your position all yeah. said to me that this needed to happen right now. And, and when you I talked about a boss, we I'll, I'll clean up the words. This is a G-rated podcast, but I guess it's called Seagull uh, uh, Managing now. 
uh, where the, the bird comes around and we use the different words on how they just poop on your head and then go home. Well, I, we had boss, I had a boss like that. And it was always like two o'clock on a Friday, you know, he'd go down and I mean, he was a really fast typer and he'd shoot out all these things. I need this report. I need this. I need that. I need that. And then like, it's like, Oh, what a week. I feel great. I'm done early. And then he'd split <laughs> because then he just dumped all that stuff. I mean, he was done. And then he dumped that stuff. And that those were things where it's like, man, I'm going to be here till four or five o'clock at night because I don't want to take it home. And so those are the things where, you know, looking back at it, you know, do yeah. you really need this by Monday morning at 7 a.m.? You know, no, I'm not going to look at it till the end of the day. Okay, then I can put it aside. And then that goes back to that boundaries. I own them. Like I have to decide, you know, like when I decide I'm going to stay late just so I don't have to work on it on the weekend. That's my choice. Maybe not mm-hmm. a great choice not let it go until Monday and work on it on Monday? Sometimes no, but yeah. that, that's, I think, the key in finding, uh, you know, finding those boundaries. Yeah, and I also think that a lot of times with, with someone that's your supervisor or someone that has that authority or that basically almost control in some ways of the money that you're going to make and your career and all of those types of things. We, we feel that we have to please this person. We have to make sure that we're, we're doing what we need to do. And one of the things that we have really focused on, I say it all the time at the very beginning, uh, I said this, no is a complete sentence. So if you are feeling overloaded or overworked, whatever it is, we simply request that you communicate. And we do this across the board uh, as well. So I had an employee that even asked me, well, what are my working hours? And I said, well, what hours do you need to work to get your job done? And I said, to make sure that you're communicating, you know, with, with your clients, with your coworkers, things like that. She's like, oh, so just be an adult. I'm like, yes, that's what we expect is for people to be an adult and for us to also be able to say no, because we don't know what's going on in their life. And that's the biggest part is the human element of what all might be going with going on with them. So a lot of times people will hear me and I'll say, I'm going to get a massage. Like I have figured out that my body and my mind sometimes needs to shut down in order to revive myself. And so on, you know, almost uh, every six weeks on a Saturday, I tend to do it. And sometimes I'm not able to, I go get a massage because I know that that's something that I need. But when you also think about um, the, the career aspect, when a boss is asking you, uh, to do something, is that an alignment with your goals? You know, is that something now keep in mind for me, it's always stepping up. We were always trying to help each other. That's ultimately what it's about. But if I'm asking, or if someone else is asking them to do something that really isn't in alignment with what their goals are, shouldn't we be raising our hand and saying, Hey, you know, just want to check in on this, you know, to, for us to get an alignment, uh, on things. And that's a lot of times what, what the no and the boundaries are about is making sure that you are in alignment from a communication perspective. That that's the, that's the whole thing, right? Is being able to effectively communicate a no, that is a no, a yes, that is a yes. And then, you know, we, we talked earlier about that pause, but I think that's where we, end up, we hear so many counterfeit no's and counterfeit yeses. Like how many times has somebody yeah. said, you know, yes, to get you out of the office. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll be at the office mixer on Thursday. No problem. And then because it's Monday and they know between now and Thursday that they're going to come up with a reason that they don't have to. And it'll be some kind of work related thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Would you not have rather heard a no? But yep. it is. And, and I haven't been in, in a work situation for a long time that I wasn't there to manage myself. Just kind of like I've been I've worked. They've let me be an adult for a long time. You know what? Yeah. I'd have to ask, what are my work hours? Because what if I do? I probably work longer hours ultimately anyways, because I'm driven to get my my jobs done. So Mm -hmm. there is that driven part of it, expectation that you have. And and we all know the people that aren't producing because you you just want people to go in and do their job and then go home no matter what time it is. So, but I know this, like it's been years, like I said, I haven't Mm -hmm. had that type of boss, but I know it's out there. So, you know, that's the whole key is giving people opportunity or tips on how to create those boundaries and how to have a good no 
and a good yes. And be willing to stand to that because there, there is, I mean, we, we can't kid ourselves. And I think you, you sounds like you're in a great organization. I work for a great organization that lets me manage, you know, my time as well too, but there's people out there who a no could mean they lose their job. And, you know, it's easy for yep. me to start in, you know, my direct deposit paycheck to say, you know, you don't, you shouldn't have to be there, but those are real. You know, I worked paycheck to paycheck for a lot of years worked hourly. My wife stayed home, watched the kids. And so you missing those days, you, you put up with a lot of stuff that you shouldn't have looking back at it. You know, and that's probably one thing is how do you encourage people to be able to set those boundaries to set themselves first? Because at some point, you know, it's kind of like this podcast, like it was a, it wasn't going well when we tried it, my internet wasn't working. You know, this year we're having just a deeper, better conversation. Maybe mm-hmm. it's the same thing with your, you know, the company you're in, you think oh, I can't afford to leave. Well, maybe you can't afford not to, if mm-hmm. you're going to go where people are, are going to respect you because you're, you're not out there looking. And I was there. I mean, you just, you kept working in that job because I needed that paycheck to come in, but how do yeah. you do that? How do you, how do you encourage people to be able to create those boundaries that could, it could affect their paycheck. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of a conversation that I had with someone. Uh, One of the things that, so marketers, we're a lot of times very, uh, it's a very thankless job uh, in a lot of ways. So especially in the AEC industry, you're doing proposals. I remember doing proposals at two o'clock in the morning, getting things done. And I had this person that said, I need more staff members. And I can't get my leadership to understand that I need more people. And I'm afraid I'm going to lose people. I'm not going to have enough people. Um, then then it's become going to become even worse. So my suggestion to them was think about things from their perspective. So when we think about the different types of people, and I think that's what ends up being important. And so I I said, you know, from an executive, they're talking about growth, you know, so it's, it's either you're going to miss out on some growth or you're going to give them more growth. So if you're able to communicate it in that way, then it's, that it's in that point. Um, So as an example, I said, no, go, you know, go, no, go. For example, it was letting them know that I'm going to be doing these go, no, goes And I'm going to be evaluating whether we should or shouldn't be going after things. So I'm now starting to set a boundary because I'm saying this go, no, go. If it doesn't fit this threshold, it is now, one, not hitting the growth expectation that you have. Two, it's also I'm dictating or I'm stating how much workload we can actually do. So if I only have three people and I know that I can only do 15 proposals a month, whatever it is, I'm now setting the expectation these other ones are going to get cut off. And her question was, well, what happens whenever he comes back and he says, well, we have to go after this? I would say, well, let me know which one I will be removing from my list. And she was like, "Uh, okay, but, you know, but, but, but. And I was just like, look, as a manager over other people, it is actually your responsibility to make sure that you're helping your staff. Because if you aren't able to step up and say no, you are now not only impacting yourself, but you're impacting your entire staff because you can't say no. So think of it in his perspective, first and foremost, and what's important to him, but show him that what you're doing is looking at it based on profit. That is what you have hired me for. That's goal. That's alignment and goals, your expectation for me. Two, I'm letting you know what I can and can't do. And then if you want something else, then let me know what, what it is it is that's going to go away to the, to the wayside <laughs> because my, my expectation and my, you know, what it is, my boundary is not changing, but I, I'm willing to negotiate which one you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are negotiating, but that, so you make a great point of prioritizing because yeah. that I think comes into play when you're going to decide to say yes or no or maybe, or not now. I think not now is completely acceptable to say that. And what, you know, what you're talking about, like coming in and here's this, and it starts getting piled on. I've used these words, which is, what do you want me not to do? 
Exactly. Like, no, it's, and it's just similar to what you said. I've said those same things. It's like, I can't do all of this. I can't do all of this by the end of today. I know what my workload is and I can't stay till nine o'clock tonight. What do you not want done? And it's amazing how when you really learn to prioritize and that's, that's a skill. It's a mm -hmm. practice. It's not always easy for some people, but everybody can learn how to do it. You realize that there are, you know, is it at life threatening level or is it, can it wait till tomorrow? And there's that range in between. And I do it a lot because I, I work in, I, I do scrum. I, my friend uh, Felipe has taught me how to do scrum. And when you're doing scrum, which is a lightweight framework for problem solving and yeah. for planning, when you are setting up your scrum board and you're setting up your to-do list, you're I'm constantly prioritizing. Now, this mm -hmm. is probably a bad, I'll tell you how I learned to prioritize. Like I've, I've ran manpower for a lot of years. And I'm sorry, but there's always, here's your top employee and here's your bottom employee. And there's a, a gradient in between. And we've had to do that. Like when we were slow, when I was doing a lot of work at Miller Coors, like you'd get slow and we had we had to let people go. We tried to keep them as long as we can. Mm -hmm. That That's just how it works. But that is, that's a prioritizing of skill sets of, mm -hmm. you know, responsibilities and know that these people can, they will go find another job somewhere else. We just, we're going to lose them. Like it was bad for us to lose them and it was bad for them to move on, but they had other work. But that prioritizing is really the most important thing for me to be able to say yes or no. And then even with the scrum idea, sometimes as the um, product owner, as the guy who's going to be deciding how this is, you know, it, where this sits, sometimes those priorities change. You know, our relationships change in what we need. So we're able to move that up and prioritize, but you still know what your limitations are at the end of the day or end of the week. And you have to be able to make those decisions. And I have put things aside that suddenly were important yesterday that were suddenly now the most important thing. And it's amazing how you do all that. And, you know, nobody died, uh, you know, no, no trains crashed, you know, no, no airplanes, you know, fell out of the sky when you really look at, you know, that idea of prioritizing those types yeah. of things. Well, and the other thing that I would say is like, I had an employee this weekend, they reached out to me and they were like, oh, I, I woke up in a panic and here it is Saturday. I forgot that it was the end of the month. And that's why you were asking me to do these things. They were like, I worked on it this today. And I'm like, why? I'm like, why are you working on it? Like, go enjoy your weekend. Like this wasn't, this wasn't something I was, you know, this isn't life or death. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but she was, it, you know, she felt obligated still. And, you know, and this is another person that is a people pleaser that I'm going to be working on. And I'm probably going to do that same thing that I did with the other person. All right, we're going to go a whole week. And the other person I did like for another week, I was like, you still need some practice. <laughs> it's saying no to me. Uh, and so I think that it's just so important. But one of the things you just said is that you can say no, simply no. Sometimes people are uncomfortable saying no, and you can say, no, I'm afraid I can't, or unfortunately I have plans, or, you know, I'm not going to be able to fit this in. That is saying no, but you can also do it with a yes. And the way you said it was almost a yes as well. You know, so yes, I can do X, Y, Z, you know, uh, when, you know, I can make this a priority which item do you not want to be a priority? So you're not saying you can't do what they said that they wanted. You're just saying something else is going to have to fall to the wayside. And that's a perfect example of saying no with a yes. Exactly. And, and that's a great approach too. If you're concerned about, you know, losing your job, it's like, yeah, I would love to do that, but I mm -hmm. can't do all of it. And I don't think there's anyone who wouldn't hear that and say, okay, I get it. And in some cases, that's where they get allow some empathy in there. What I love that you do is a practice of, and also being being a strong enough leader to say it's okay to say no. Not all leaders say that. And I think that's an important thing to do on, on a social level to allow your direct reports uh, and even people around you to say it's okay to say no. You know, I've heard people clarify that before and maybe in a way that not as I think not as driven, not as intuitive as you are purposely training a skill, but they say it's okay to say no. You know, they give you, they kind of give you that permission. Right. I've also heard those exact same words when it's okay to say no, 
<laughs> wink, wink, but I prefer you not. <laughs> <laughs> but to understand that, and that's where I think it comes to that, having that, the ability to have a conversation to say that, you know, let's, let's prioritize together and let them make that decision. I do that a lot as, as I've learned to the coach, learn to be better, you know, just to be a better you know, communicator is to have that conversation to allow those decision, that decision load to be on somebody else. And when you allow, which is basically what you're doing, you're mm -hmm. not saying no, but you're saying, okay, what do you not want me to do? Because I think a lot of times, because you mentioned this too, about your employees, their workload. I don't think people really understand their workload in, in general construction, they talk about, you know, a PM should be able to run, you know, 50, $60 million worth of work, which is just kind of a, a made up number because I had, because is it 50 million on one job or is it 50, $1 million jobs? Mm -hmm. I was approached by my former boss when we're working in small projects and he says, well, I want to grow this division to be a hundred million dollar division. How many superintendents do you need? And there's an actual question he asked me. I said, yeah. oh, that's easy. And I did this too. So that's easy. Uh, is it a hundred million dollar jobs or one $100 million job? Because if it's one $100 million job, I probably need maybe four or five superintendents and you know whatever that staff is going to, if it's 100 $1 million jobs, then I'm going to need 100 superintendents. And so there's just this big gap between that question, but understanding that, you know, this is, there's, there's so many, letting him kind of choose that, right? Well, I don't mm -hmm. know what they are. We just want to grow the division. Well, I can't tell you how many people we need until we see the quantity of jobs that we have in front of us. And that's yeah. being able to process and have that conversation with somebody to say, because I could easily have said, you know, I don't know, 50 superintendents. Well, go get them. So I'll go out and get 50 superintendents. And then the work doesn't roll in. And then what? You know, mm -hmm. I've got superintendents sitting around. That's not going to happen. Not in today's market. That's for sure. Yeah. And I would also add, I had one particular employee that a lot of times I, I'm very quick for the most part because I have to quickly solve issues. And that's just a skill set that I've I've sort of learned or maybe it's intuitive. It's just a part of what I do. Uh, but I had another employee that I knew that this person was going to take time. That's what I had learned from them. And I was glad that they didn't feel obligated to give me an answer. They would say to me, can I take a moment to think about this? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And so a lot of times people feel obligated even just to say or give an answer. But sometimes when we aren't sure in any situation, whether it's no, yes, giving an answer, just asking for, can I get a moment to reflect upon this or the pause, as you said. And so that's really where the power is. And that's where I have found that when I identify all of the different employees in the things that they're good at and the things that they might have weaknesses in that will impact their position or the company, it's my obligation to help empower them. And so a lot of the things that people do day in, day out, have nothing to do with the technical. It has to do with the really hard stuff. It's the communication. It's the setting expectations. It's being in alignment. It's all of those types of things. And also understanding the fear aspect. Fear is a huge driver for so many things in the workplace that if I haven't dealt with that in my personal life, even just learning how to say no, that then rolls over into my business life. So I can't emphasize enough that it's important that we really understand employees from a human perspective and the things that that maybe they're struggling with, but it really has to do with maybe something personal within their life. That's really where I have found I'm able to empower people is really understanding what's going on in their life in general. In general. And then that, that does affect workload, but knowing mm -hmm. that being empathetic towards that, that's really, really huge. That's, I mean, that's, that's what a brilliant way to manage your people because, you know, mm -hmm. back to that workload thing, when you look at, so I was saying, you know, 50 million or, you know, $51 million jobs, there's, there's this perception that somebody's running smaller projects that they should be running $40 million worth of job at that level of, you know, of project manager. And that's not accurate because there, there, I was on a small job that had, say it's $4 million. 
it had 27 or 26, I think, subcontractors on the project. Mm -hmm. There was also another job being run as about 40, $50 million. It had one more like the contract. I mean, all of those things does not dictate the workload of your employee. You have to understand yeah. what that is and then add in there. You know what? His dog died or his mom's not well, or his wife's sick, or the kids, you know, have whatever. And to be able to understand that and be empathetic towards that and know that, you know, those things are factors that are going to affect quality of work. They're going to affect their responsive stuff. So I think that's really one of the things maybe driving down and understanding this, the power of no from a leadership perspective is yeah. having that empathy to know the background to what may be a yes or a no or a maybe to know that there is that background, that thing that's in the background. Yeah, I agree. You know, the biggest thing I think with practicing saying no is one doing just that, practicing it. And what I loved about the exercise that we did is I was giving this person permission to say no when they probably wouldn't have felt comfortable doing that. Um, but a a part of even saying no, some of the other things that can be really helpful to keep in mind is also practicing being clear early on. So like if you are want to say a no, this goes back to your example of someone that wants to say no, but they're saying yes, but really, you know, the three days later, they're going to say no, just practice saying it sooner. No, you know, I actually have too much on my plate or whatever it is. And another thing that people can do is express gratitude for being asked. And so if someone asks you something, say, oh, I really appreciate you thinking about me. Uh, unfortunately, that that won't work, whatever it, it might be. But sometimes just doing that can be an easier way to to be able to say no. Um, but apart along the lines of saying no, the biggest thing that I have found is the difference between passive and aggressive. You want the middle part, you want assertive. So you want it to be respectful whenever you're saying no. So it's making sure that you're, you're doing it in a kind way as well, or respectful way, and just being more concise uh, about, about what it is that's going on. Um, but a lot of times people just have a hard time even saying just the word no. Yes. 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 And no, no, definitely. No, <laughs> I mean, it's not coming out right, but you're right that people have a hard time saying that, but I know that there's times when I have negotiated, uh, you know, the, the, the deadline and mm -hmm. what is this deliverable? And it's like, you know what, because especially on when I was a project manager for a while, there were some deadlines on some reports that we wanted in on Monday, but in reality, the guy wanted to compile them because Tuesday was his time frame to do it. And he was presenting it on a Wednesday or a Thursday. So you're allowed that. So again, back to Felipe's thing, like all deadlines are a lie. When right. you negotiate that, he's like, you know what? He goes, I know you're busy. Get it to me Thursday morning. Then I can put it in there and we'll be fine. Well, guess what you do when you do that to an employee? Because I'm saying this happened to me. I delivered earlier than that. So mm -hmm. you get to the point where you know that you've been given this permission. I'm going to actually work a little extra harder on this other stuff so I can deliver this because you allowed me to do that. And I think that's important part of being able to have that ability to negotiate and talk about and then be given permission by your leader to say, it, it is okay for you to deliver that a little bit later. Well, Sarah, this has been absolutely fantastic. I'm so glad that we found the time to do this. What I want to do uh, as we get near a wrapping up, we're going to zoom in right here. All right. Uh, let's, I always like to have the UC moment. The UC moment is the uncommon communicator moment where we look at, you know, we've been talking for almost an hour now. What, what is the, the key takeaway we that we can give to the listeners today from our conversation? Yeah. I think when you feel uncomfortable, on what you should say, whether it's no or yes, it's taking that pause and understanding the real reasons that you might want to say one or the other. I think that is where the power is in understanding the why and understanding whether the why is you want to say no and why it is you want to say no. Um, so understanding your values, understanding the real crux of it, because sometimes it could be fear 
And those are things that are sort of an invitation for us to overcome things. So understanding, does it align with your values? If it does, then it's probably the best thing to, to do is say no. But if it's fear or something else that's really because you don't want to extend yourself beyond your who it is you are, then sometimes saying yes actually can help you grow uh, instead of saying no. So say no the why and then say the no or the yes. But that's, a, I mean, yeah, the growth is on the other side of that. Maybe that's your limiting factor. But I, I think that's a great wrap up of that is, is know the why, right? Know what the purpose is behind it. And then let your no's be no's and let your yes be yeses. Though that, that's great. I think that's a fantastic UC moment. Let's uh, pause for a minute here. And how can people get a hold of Sarah? How did, how did we meet? Yeah. And how would you like other people to connect with you? Yeah. So uh, for those that might want to check out a little bit more, more on Boy Bass, which stands for Bring Out Your Badass Self, we actually do a live stream uh, every Friday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. So you can come there. You can also connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, and then James and I are actually a part of a group called the No BS Tribe. Uh, and that's how we actually connected. And so check them out as well if you're not familiar with them. I'll throw all of those into the show notes. Definitely. Those are all great connections. Check out your podcast. It's amazing. I don't, I try not to say the bad words, but uh, <laughs> it's allowed on this show because you're, you're really doing, you're emphasizing people, you're empowering people with that mm -hmm. podcast. And that's what I think is so powerful when you do that. And there's no other way, like you can't tone that down, you know, bring out your own bad, person. I mean, you you have to be your badass self, right? You have That's to right. use those words. I said it. The Uncommon Communicator said it. I might edit myself out later, but that is all we got. And so let's well, one more time, a recap on the UC moment is really know your why and say your no. That's what I'm going to call it. And that's all we've got. See you. Bye.